Now, from the 25th day of November up until the 10th day of December, culminates 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. It's an opportunity where we lend our voices to the war against violence against women, and we all must pay, play our part. Now, the theme for this year is Orange the World, hashtag Hear Me Too, where victors and survivors are encouraged to share their testimonies, to share their stories of survival, and all this would end up helping us bring down the people who are perpetrators of this dastardly act. Now, joining us today on the show to look at the celebration and the 16 days of activism is the founder of Women at Risk International Foundation, Dr. Kemi De Silva Ibru. She'll be joining us to share how exactly her foundation is celebrating this, how you and I can be a part of this, and what we need to know when it comes to gender-based violence. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you Welcome once again now. for having me, Olive. And where the conversation is focused on, we're, we're looking more a lot of, at women. And why would, you, why would you say that the focus is a lot on women? You know, we know that men have been abused as well, but there's a lot of focus on women. Maybe you would shine some light on that for us as well. Well, when we speak on gender-based violence, gender-based violence is a term that is loosely interchangeable with violence against women. There is never a direct reference to the fact that the survivor is usually a woman. But globally, the more vulnerable group are women. And when we look at global statistics, one in three women are survivors of domestic or sexual abuse. And back home in Nigeria, one in four women before the age of 18 would have had one violent sexual encounter. The period you just referred to, the 16 days of activism, is a global campaign that was originated in the UN. It's one that's carried out annually, and it's a time for all of us, organizations, individuals, to come together and to raise our voices against this particular issue of gender-based violence. So when you talk about gender-based violence, we just saw a video of the great work you guys are doing at Wari, Thank you by very the way. much. I, I want to say, how exactly, you know, did you come up with the initiative of Wari, first off? Then secondly, how did you make yourself so reachable for people? Because it's good so that if anybody has such issues and they want to relate them to you, how can they reach Warif exactly? Well, my journey started with my professional background. Okay. I mean, I'm an obstetrician and a gynecologist. Um, returned back to Nigeria 10 years ago, and I started working in the public sector. And back then, there was very little infrastructure in place for survivors of abuse. And so many a time, they would be seen in public sector facilities, such as the one I worked in, and they would be met with suspicion. The history and the story behind the abuse is usually ignored. The treatment was minimal. There was certainly no counseling or follow-up. And then they would typically be sent back home to the place of abuse. Because 90% of the time, the narrative will tell you that home and places of safety are usually the spaces that the abuse occurs. And the perpetrators are typically well-known members of either a family, a close family friend, or a teacher or person of authority that takes advantage of that position. So I very quickly realized that there was more to be done. And for the first few years, I would offer my services in my medical capacity pro bono, seeing cases that are referred to me by different organizations or just well-intentioned facilities and members of, the, pop, uh, members of you know, the public. And I would try the best that I could, given my limited access to infrastructure, because all I had was a medical facility. Um, two years ago, for me, my tipping point were a series of horrendous cases that involved children, the youngest of which was two years of age. And I felt that the time was now for me to actually invest more in addressing this issue. And so the Warif um, Women at Risk International Foundation was incorporated. The very first thing that was clear to all of us that were already in the fight was that we needed a safe space. We needed a safe haven, as you said, where women could come, could seek immediate medical attention, could get the relevant counseling, and because Nigeria is not a welfare country, to actually <coughs> access social welfare. Because many times women make poor decisions to stay because they have no other options. They are not aware that shelters exist. They don't know of legal aid or law firms that are offering pro bono services. Some of these women aren't even aware that it's a crime. 
and that they have a legal right to actually seek justice. And then when we look at the economic and the financial constraint of this woman, you oftentimes realize that if she had a vocational skill, perhaps, then she would be able to make the right choices because she's now empowered. So the facility offers free services. Our medical services cover both the physical as well as the HIV and pregnancy tests. We start the post-HIV drugs that are necessary if seen within a 72-hour window. And we also offer forensic medical examinations if seen within a 72-hour window so that this can be used in the judiciary system. We're fortunate enough to be members of the Lagos State Domestic and Sexual Violence Response Team. And so this validates our actual paperwork. And it's wonderful to be able to say that we can then work alongside not just the Lagos State agencies, but also the Lagos Police Force. And this is really, Great. it's really amazing work that you're doing. So thank you and well done. And we look forward to seeing more of this being done. Mm -hmm. But speaking of looking forward to seeing more of activism being done, let's bring this international celebration back home here in Nigeria. Ours is a country where we encourage, unfortunately, things like rape culture. We encourage uh, victim shaming such that when people speak up, they're being criticized, they're being at attacked. Questions like, what were you wearing? Why did you go there? Didn't you enjoy it? And such other stupid and ignorant questions are being asked when there is a case of abuse. With rise of campaigns ab abroad, you know, in other countries, the hashtag Me Too, hashtag Time's Up, you know, Coming up, we're starting to see more people speaking about abuse in Hollywood and in other sectors. When are we going to get there? First of all, how are we faring in Nigeria with regards to you know, looking at our international counterparts and the way they treat abuse? How are we faring in Nigeria? And how can we lend our voices to ensure that we are being heard and that we reduce the, the stigma associated uh, surrounding abuse as well as reduce the incidences of abuse? Like you rightly said, there is a global stigmatization that surrounds gender-based violence and sexual assault. And unfortunately, in Nigeria, we have that peculiarity of our culture and our patriarchal nature in this environment that sadly makes the situation all the more worse for that woman. Because women are generally subjugated in this country. Women don't necessarily have a voice whether or not she has been abused. Now, when an abuse occurs in a home, and the primary concern of that family is to hide the act because typically the perpetrator might be that family member. This woman is ostracized and so she has no voice and she has no safe space. And then the abuse sadly will continue on to a point where she either starts to experience immediate physical effects. She could either have an unwanted pregnancy. She could either contract a sexually transmitted disease like HIV or she has more long-term effects, like depression, or anxiety, or panic attacks, or just feelings of distrust because of the situation that she surrounds herself in. So our issues are a little more peculiar and a little more layered when it comes to how do we address this particular problem. I am happy to say that more and more organizations like ours are putting a spotlight on the problem. I wouldn't say that the problem is getting worse, because we run baseline surveys on all the initiatives that we carry out. And we have confirmed that statistical data of one in four girls, and actually one in eight boys before age 18 would be a survivor of rape or abuse. What I would say is that there appears to be better reporting. And more and more platforms are being brought up, blogs and social media is playing a huge role in allowing women the anonymity to speak up and lend a voice to this problem if they're not necessarily ready to stand up and be countered and to say, you know, this happened to me too. But we're getting there. So I how think. can we now do this as individuals? I know you're running a campaign as well. Right. So, so how right can now, individuals and organizations join Well, what campaign? we are doing over the period of the 16 days is we're running an aggressive online campaign. As you rightly said, the theme is Hear Me Too. And so the focus is on the survivors and hearing the stories from the survivors. And so we have daily posts and daily quotes from survivors that we have seen and treated at our facility. And the idea is to start the conversation, to have other people read, see, be impacted by it, repost, and then expand our reach. The more we talk about a problem, the more we reduce the shame that surrounds the problem. And we now give these women their power back 
because we're now giving them their voice back. Okay, so now I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask this question. You mentioned um, having a case of a two-year-old, and likely from the way you told the story, that particular act of violence might have been done by the child's father. It was allegedly the child's father. The child's father. Correct. Now, in a case like that, and maybe other cases similar to that, how can this issue of gender-based violence be avoided in the first place? Well, to avoid the issue is a tall order. Okay. Because as we just rightly stated, there's so many layers to this issue. We have situations where violence begets violence. You have home environments where children are exposed to sexual violence from a very young age. And because there's nobody there to teach as a role model the right type of behavior, that average boy of five or six that sees his father being the abuser will naturally see this as his norm and would grow up to become that potential perpetrator himself. So one of the things that we practice in the um, foundation is under our education pillar is to target those boys, the adolescent age schoolboy, that has those, if you will, behavioral concerns that we are worried about because of his mindset. And so we start to educate him by changing that mindset. It's called the Boys um, Conversation Cafe and we use role models, and we sit down with age groups between 12 and 16, and talking about their issues, we're trying, hoping to chart and change their narrative. Is that similar to what you did with the gatekeepers? So the gatekeepers is actually a community-based initiative, and that was the midwives that you saw um, in the short video that you showed earlier on. Um, the idea behind the gatekeepers is very simply, 54% of Nigeria still lives in the rural area, and we spend a lot of time highlighting on social media with the use of radio and wonderful TV shows like yours about the issues. But sadly, the woman in the rural area does not have access to all of these. And this is where we now say, well, let's target this audience. Let's go into your communities. Let's talk to your gatekeepers, like your traditional midwives, who play an important role in your communities. And how about we train them? So they become first respondents for this problem. Fantastic. So they now go back into the community and they serve the community and they have the appropriate training and then they refer back to us. I mean, I saw that man whom you interviewed in the shop. He happens to be a traditional birth exactly attendant how himself. Exactly, he now knows to document Exactly, it, so we gave them brilliant. collated data that they collect. They feel empowered now because they not only have a toolkit, they also have a referral system in place. And we trained the first 500 midwives last year in 2017, sponsored by the ACT Foundation. Okay. And we've seen over 150 active cases from that training. Fantastic. Two of which, as I said, are now um, in, the, in the courts, which okay. is wonderful. As we're, we're wrapping up this conversation, let's look at what exactly is gender-based violence or what, uh, what amounts to violence. This is because, like you rightly mentioned earlier, some people have been abused and they don't even know that they have been abused. So when you tell us what this violence or what, uh, what abuse really is, when people are found, when they identify themselves in some of the symptoms or some of the traits you're going to mention, how do they contact Worry for help? Well, abuse goes beyond the physical. Like you said, when we talk about abuse, abuse could be emotional, abuse could be economic when you have a situation where one party holds control or power over the other and takes on due advantage of that, that is considered abuse. Now, in any situation, if that party is under the age of 18, that individual is a minor, and that is illegal, regardless of whether the individual wanted to participate in the act. When we talk about consent, this is where we now go into the area of did she or did she not want it? Did she, was she on drugs? Was she drunk? Like the was she young lady we saw on the video. Aha, uh -huh. was she? By 10 men. No, is, I mean, so are you saying to me that she wanted it in spite of the fact that she was unable to give her consent? And that's a huge area that's particularly key in this conversation of gender-based violence. And then you have, of course, the victim blaming, like you said where you know the argument is well what was she wearing what does that matter or what time of the day was it and whether or not she was asking for it because she actually went to the party i mean, I mean very UK, simply no means no exactly and it's a woman's prerogative to change her mind so whether or not she's an adult over the age of 18 if she at any point in time says no 
then anything beyond that is considered an illegal act. So at the end of the day, if you do not remember anything from this conversation, you must remember that no is no. When a woman decides, I have had enough, I can't continue, any further act is constituted um, violent, okay? Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you once and again for having me. And I'd like you to please me. give us your contact details. You know, how can people contact Warif? Those who know someone who's going through abuse, those who are currently being abused, how can they contact Warif for help? So the Warif Center is at number 6, Turton Street, off Thurban Avenue in Yaba. We're open six days a week, Monday through to Saturday, from 8 to 5 p.m., as well as all public holidays. And all services are free and it's a walk-in facility. Is there like a call line? We also have a 24-hour confidential helpline. The number is 0809-210-0009. I'll repeat that, 0809-210-0009. And we're on all the social media platforms. Our handle is warif underscore ng. And that's Thank Facebook, so Twitter, and Instagram. Thank and we hope that people have Thank gotten so these much. contact details. You might not be the one who has been abused, but you will know somebody that has been abused, or you will know someone that knows someone. This is the help that they need. Thank you so much for joining Thank us. Thank you Dr. very Kelly. much for having me. To enjoy more of this, our Ugunke videos when you just watch, press this button to subscribe on top of our YouTube page. You go love her.